Hi, you're watching Enemy, and we're here with Mike Shinoda. How's it going, man? I talk now. <laughs> if you want, yeah, go for it, yeah. <laughs> How are you doing? I'm good. I am good. How's your London stay? Have you been out and about? It's been, like, compressed. I understand you've been sampling some local delicacies. You had a Nando's last night, right? Yeah, yeah. I like Nando's. <laughs> well, I actually, it was funny because I actually wanted Indian. All right. And, um... Are like one of the folks I'm running around here with. Um, he uh, he kept suggesting Nando's like in a very subtle way, and like you wanted Nando's, right? Yeah. <laughs> like, have you been to Nando's? And he kept doing this thing. I'm like, can you just say you want to go to Nando's? And he's like, no, 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 I'm fine with whatever. It's like one of those things. So we ended up there. No, I love it. Uh, I love it. So, um, how have you found uh, the world's reaction to Post Traumatic since its release? It's been really great. It's it's actually been more, um, almost like more uh, connective than I thought. And then I, I hadn't thought of it being that way. Like when I was making it, all I was thinking was just like, just write in your diary. Mm -hmm. Like write, this stuff is what's happening. Just capture the truth of whatever is happening right now. And some days it was like I had an idea, not for a song, just a, a, like, oh, this is going on right now. And then it would... I'd try and make it into a song. And um, other times, like, it was like a whole week I felt a certain way or I was curious about a certain thing. Um, so that might be, for example, the second song on the record, I was, uh, I did the, wrote and recorded the first verse the day of our Hollywood Bowl tribute show. And then I wrote and recorded the second verse the day after. So you get a very specific picture of, like, my mental state and emotional state mm. those, in those two days. Um, as opposed to later on in the record, I was having like kind of having some fun with certain tracks and I did this track called Ghosts because people kept talking like telling me ghost stories and I don't believe nor like disbelieve. So I'm kind of like in this weird place in the middle where um, I wanted to write a song about just what people were telling me but without like sticking to one side or the other. And so it was like almost a writing challenge to like get that right and have it not feel depressing and not have it feel like silly mm. you know yeah so you were grappling with what was happening at the time was, was any kind of challenge because obviously you were dealing with some very complex things did you just want yeah. it to be natural or was there a part of your brain going don't go down this route it can't sound like this um there was a point at which like in the early early stuff the first month or two it was all looking in the moment and in behind and it was very dark heavy stuff. And I think I did about, I don't know, four or five songs that way. And then the album is ended up being 16 tracks. So all the rest of it is kind of weaving in and out of different other things that I was thinking. So it, it goes from looking back and then being, having being this dark album to like looking forward and there's elements of hope and even like having fun mm. in it, you know? So at what point did you kind of feel the compulsion to make an album because it couldn't have been an easy time and you were obviously dealing, no. you were living life as it was. Yeah, I was, I was just like writing, um, I was just writing to, was, when I was doing the music, like a lot of just doing, playing an instrument and, and um, m you know, producing the thing was very meditative and um, that was like helped me think through things. And then I also found that like as I was writing the lyrics that the music needed to just just set up the lyrics or complement it or, or be the foundation on which the lyrics would, would work, mm. you know? And so it wasn't so much of a thought, I didn't I wasn't thinking too much about genre or like what is the you know, the statement sonically of the album. It's just this is just what I wanna hear and this is what supports the lyrics, the, the vocals. Yeah. At what point did you decide that it was going to be a Mike Shinoda album and not a Fort Minor album or something that you would save up to do with Linkin Park later down the line? Yeah, I mean, the, it was pretty early on that I realized, okay, this stuff is all very personal, so what does that mean? And in the context of the band, like, num number one, it being personal, it just seemed like the right presentation for it to be just me. Um, and then number two, knowing our our process under normal circumstances it can be a little complicated and long 
and I kind of wanted to get these things out like as fast as possible. Like I wanted fans to hear from me in real time. Like if I felt a certain way on a certain day, I wanted the fans to, to, to for me, give, to communicate that soon, you know, so that we were kind of on the same page. Yeah. And, and that ended up being important, like for me. I, I, I put out the first three songs in January and then basically put out a track every month or so after that till, till the album came out because it, I knew that it would effectively like catch the fans up with how I'm doing for the people that care, you know, like catch them up to how I'm doing in a way that um, allowed, most importantly, allowed them to realize like I'm not in the same place that I was like say 10, 11 months ago. Yeah. That was very dark. Mm. I wasn't even like leaving my house. And now I'm like, this like you know I'm out and about we're doing some shows and having fun going to Nando's going to Nando's <laughs> so would you say that the record is purely a diary of these snapshots of time or would you say it's in any way helped with the grieving process oh it's both yeah yeah because like I think that when if you're dealing with difficult things art is therapy first of all like mm. if you if you're drawing or painting or coloring or writing a poem or just playing an instrument without even the intention of like writing a song or doing anything structured like the act of doing it is it it engages a different part of your brain for me it's it's meditative it slows my brain down and allows them for to make room for introspection and also, when I was writing the words, I had this weird thing happening where um, I would write stuff and I'd listen to the song, and like some songs just sounded wrong. Like I was like, "Oh, this part of the lyric is kind of garbage. Like I don't know why it just doesn't hit me right." And many times when that was happening, it was because I was BSing myself, like mm. I was kidding myself. So it wasn't that it was just a bad lyric; it's that it wasn't like I, my thought process, my head was actually kind of wrong. Yeah. And it made me go, "Oh, okay, like." I'm kind of not being honest with myself about how I feel about a thing. Um, I wish I had a better example of what that is. It's like in, in, the, in the beginning of the album on Place to Start, for example, I talk a lot about, like I listen to the lyrics now, and it's almost like foreign mm. to me, how, yeah. how um, unsure, the song is very unsure, the song is very like, it's qu questioning myself a lot, and and there's, it's kind of hopeless. And that was true in the time when I wrote it. And then I listened back to it later and I went like, wow, I've like really come a long way. Like I've cha things have changed a lot since I wrote that song. And so it was more important to me to include that song on it, on the, on the album. And in light of that, I mean, how, I mean, I know you've only done a couple of shows with this record, but how does it feel to revisit those songs and inhabit that space again when you play them live? Um, it changes over time. Like I, in, um, I give you an example. Like I did the song over again that has the two, the verses of the, um, day of the Hollywood Bowl show and the day after. Um, a few shows ago I did both verses. And when I was doing the first verse, it's like something about the flow of the show. Like I expected the energy of the show to be a little more positive and upbeat and it had this momentum going up and then it hit that verse and it went mm. and I, and I was, as I was doing it, I was like, I'm gonna remove this. I'm gonna remove this verse because it's, it's, it sucked the air out of the, the room a little bit. And so then the next time I did it, I just went straight from the chorus to the second verse and the momentum stayed up, you know? Um, I haven't hit anything yet that I've, there's certain like, we didn't play, for example, we didn't play um, Breaking the Habit at the tribute show because that's just topically, that was like way too hard. Yeah. Um, and so for me on the solo shows, there's a few songs that I probably could play myself, but I don't, I don't want to even at this point. I don't want to do it. Like, um, I can sing Nobody Can Save Me and Battle Symphony from the new record, uh, the new Linkin Park record. And I... They, they, I can sing them because I, I wrote them with, it was me and, and my friend John Green, 
and I sang the demos, and they're written in a way that like I sing, I can sing those pretty well. Yeah. Um, but lyrically, a little too hard. Like not, I'm, I just feel like I know that in the long run, if I put that in the set, it's only going to be a show or two before I go like, I don't like, I don't want to sing that. Yeah. Those, I don't want to sing those words. Yeah. You know. So it's just it's a work in progress, and it's also like knowing myself as I go. And what can you tell us about the experience of the tribute show? Because it must have been a hard, like a tightrope between I'm, celebration of Chester and kind of. It, the thing, like you watch it and you feel that. Imagine now that it took like six weeks of rehearsal to get to the point where we were ready to play the show. Yeah. Like the the exercise of rehearsing for that show was like for all the guys was I, I like I'm looking at them in the room just like going playing these songs for the first time and then playing them over again like it was heroic the guys were just like really dedicated to just facing it and doing the show and finding the right people and getting them on the right songs like it was really great um, hard super super hard to do um, our longest set before that was like 90 minutes that's so- that set was like over three hours it was a marathon. We fell on the ground in the dressing room afterwards, just laying there like, oh my God, I can't move. Because your brain was just, all of our brains were just mush yeah. at the end of it. Um, partially because of the emotional aspect, like mainly because of the emotional aspect, but also because so much of the show required relearning our own material. It's like, oh, this song we're going to play in you know, a different key because that person sings higher. With this song, we're going to play in a different key because that one sings lower. This one, I always, for 10 years, have sung it this way, but they're going to sing my part, so I'm going to sing this other melody while I'm playing piano. It's just this, you know, the, the mental gymnastics of it were hard. Yeah. You know, while I'm thinking like, oh, this sucks doing this without Chester. Like, all of that was going on at once. Yeah. And you said it was kind of a gift to the fans. And you mentioned being surprised about the connectivity was the word you used, about this record yeah. with the fans. I mean, how, would you, how has the experience been of relaying your diary to fans? Because they've obviously been grieving and catching up as well, you know? Yeah. Well, some of them, I mean, there's a variety of connections they have with it all. Like, there are people who are just, um, there are people who, they were, like, focused on Chester. Like, Chester was their favorite member or something, however you want to look at that. Like, okay, so there was that. And then there's people that love the band as a whole and that's, you know, their connection. There are people that don't love the band, but they love Fort Minor. Mm. And then there are people that um, love me and how excited about this. They've got, like, there's sadness over, the, over, you know, Lincoln Park, but then there's also, like, excitement that I'm out and doing, some, doing things yeah. and making this music. And, and the response to the music has been really great, like a lot of positive feedback and... and a lot of fans who really love it. Um, so I'm grateful. I'm just, uh, you know, doing, doing the, the interviews, talking to fans on the street and, in the, uh, um, and online um, has been awesome for me. Like even I was, last night we had gotten in and I was, we were walking around last night or like after dinner and there was this, this young woman who like we were walking towards one another and she like, she was walking like this and then she started doing this. Like she was like, oh my God. And she's like now walking backwards. Yeah. And she starts talking to me and she starts crying. And she's like this, you know, uh, like nice looking, like professional, looks like a professional like um, person mm. with like a good job. I think she's probably Indian. Yeah. And she's now walking backwards and potentially going to walk into traffic. Like, I'm like, <laughs> stop moving. Like, you know, what are you doing? But she, like, lost her mind. Like, she was simultaneously overjoyed and surprised to see me and crying. So the, ex- the experiences have been really different. Yeah. I've never experienced that before. That was, like, the, one of the weirdest reactions to meeting a fan on the street I've ever had. And... It's all because of all of this weird stuff. It's just a weird time. Yeah. You know? And do you feel like a lot of them have connected with the message of the record of the hope at the other side of grief? Yeah. I mean, well, look, like mental health has been, a, you know, we've, it's always been an issue. Um, and with news like the Kate, Sp- you know, Kate Spade and Anthony Bourdain, for example, yeah. it's just back again. And, and it's, there is a, 
um, not the news element, but actually like on the on on the for people that have that are triggered by that that those visuals and those ideas and stuff. Mm. That's really hard for people. So um, it's a it's a wonderful opportunity to to remind journalists, social media influencers, like even if like young even people, some young people, like they one minute they have five hundred followers who are kind of friends and friends of friends. The next thing you know, some of them have like 200,000 followers and they don't realize that they have, an, they have a responsibility when some heavy stuff happens to, to be um, careful yeah. with their fans. Like these, they have all these people following them and, and if the influencer then says something like really graphic or a little thoughtless, that, is, that, acts, that tweet or that post can be a landmine for somebody. Yeah. So it's a nice moment to be, you know, talking about it and reminding everyone, like, just be really sensitive because I know you care about your fans. I care about my fans, you know, and the way you talk about it matters. Words matter. So let's... Which is why I was really, really relieved when um, Talinda called out TMZ for using the word committed because that's always really yeah. irritating. Yeah. It's not a crime. It's, you know, right. Committed is always used with crime. Yeah. It's used with, like, like... Um, you know, sins and crimes and all that. So yeah, we say died by suicide or um, any sensitive way you can put it. And um, also we talked a lot, like I think, you know, her, she's working with um, Changes Direction. They've got a nice, a really nice uh, uh, organization called 320 Changes Direction, um, focusing on mental health and the signs of mental health and Ill mental illness. And one of the things I've learned from uh, talking to them is that, you know, oftentimes we talk about uh, physical health being, you know, uh, um, present mm. in, our, in our consciousness, right? Like if you wake up and your back hurts, you're going to say, oh, my back hurts, I should take it easy today. Oh, my back hurts really bad, I should take, you know, medicine. I should, maybe I need to take Advil or something more strong. Or maybe it's really bad and I need to go see a doctor, you know, somebody, a professional. Um, and more seldom do we do that with mental health. Mm. So that's something to also be aware of, is that you can, if you wake up in the morning and you might check in with yourself about your physical health and also check in with your mental health and go, oh, I, I wasn't even thinking about it. I didn't even notice it. But now that I'm asking myself, how am I doing? I'm realizing I'm pretty down. And it's just, I just woke up feeling this way. I don't know what it is yet. I'll get to the bottom of it, I hope, but I feel bad enough that I should take it easy or I feel like I should take medicine or I feel like I need to go see a professional because this is pretty serious. Yeah. You know, and those things, all of those things are completely okay. You just have to be aware and like talking about it helps make you aware, helps you like minimize. It's like these things can feel really scary and big, but once yeah. you start talking to people about it, it doesn't feel scary and big anymore. Oftentimes it just gets to be more manageable. Yeah. I don't know if you have any advice on this, because we write about this a lot, and one half of the dialogue is going, speak out if you're not feeling great. Yeah. Is there anything, any advice you can give to people on the other side in terms of being open and willing to listen? Because half of the battle in wanting people to talk about it is the fear that they won't be listened to, you know? Yeah. Um, oftentimes for me, just being in the, with the volume of fans, that have, have expressed stuff on the, online, um, clearly there'd be no way, n no possibility of me addressing all of them, mm. right? Yeah. Um, and oftentimes what I remind them is even if you're just talking to one person, like it is, if you're talking to people and it doesn't feel like they're listening, then that's a bummer, definitely not, not awesome. But you can also communicate to them that it's making you feel bad that they're not listening. And your other option is to just go seek um, professional help. Because pro seeking professional help, like the, the pro one of the things that people will do with that, that that is unfortunate because it's incorrect is, oh, I'm paying somebody to listen to me. That's not what you're doing. What you're doing is you're going to a person who specializes in the issue that you're dealing with. Yeah. 
You're going, if you, have a, if you have a problem with your foot, then you go to a doctor who specializes in feet. You're going to somebody who specializes in the way you think because you're having a problem with your brain. Your friend who you wanted to listen to you, they're actually not an expert. Yeah. Like if I'm having back problems, do I go to my dentist and ask them what I should do with it? Do I just talk to my friend and say, hey, my back hurts, like I'm a, I can't even like get into my car and get out with like without collapsing to the ground. You know, you're a cartoonist, help me out. Yeah. Right? <laughs> That's ridiculous. It's stupid. Yeah. And yet, for some reason, we talk ourselves into feeling guilty about that. Like, yeah. oh, they're not listening to me. It's like, good, I'm glad they're not listening to you because they don't know what your problem is. They yeah. don't understand your issue at all. So who cares? They're just a student. You're a student. Go to a professional. Yeah. They know this stuff. And do you think this learning curve is going to continue to inspire? Because you strike me as someone who's working all the time. Yeah. You're like, for instance, have you written much since this record was finished? Yeah. 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 I'm always making stuff. Yeah. But a lot of times for me, like the, the making stuff, um, at this point, like most of the stuff that I'm doing is just like doodles in my computer that are uh, musical. Yeah. So it's just tracks. So a lot of that. And with that said, like I don't know, I always tell everybody, I don't know what comes next. You know, I could just wake up and put vocals on one of them. Or I could run into somebody who's like whose music I love, and they could hear one of these tracks and think, "Oh, I want to write to that," and yeah, we yeah. could work together. Like, who knows? What do you look for in a collaborator? Because you've got some pretty amazing names on this record. I mean, I um, well, on this album, most of the pretty much all the collaborators were ones that I chose because I knew that they understood the topic. Yeah, like the the they had to have gone through some kind of loss or something, you know, big um, in their lives that, that related to the types of thing that happened, the type of thing I was thinking about. Mm. Chino is a great example, yeah. you know, because they lost their bass player Chi years ago. I knew Chi, we were toured, we toured with those guys for, you know, a long time. Um, and I played at the tribute concert they had for Chi. So um, asking him to be a part of the record was, you know, one part like, hey, well, you sing on the song and another part like, dude, I want to get together and like hang out. And because like, how did you know, I picked I was picking his brain about like, what was it like after you guys lost Chi? Like, what did you do? Was there anything that was like really helpful or yeah. what's some perspective? And just as like a friend, you know. And so in terms of the cycling, I mean, I imagine you'll be on the record on the road with this record for another year. Do you have any thoughts beyond that? Have there been conversations about returning to the band or are you just going to see what happens? No, I don't, like, you know, I don't really know where it's going to go. And I'm, um, I'm basically just trying to keep everything really open, you yeah. know? Um, I'm really excited about, I'm more excited about shows now than any time I can remember. Like, just even doing, like, a club show the other night for 600 people, like... I was supposed to be on stage. I'd written like a set for 60 minutes and I was on stage for like 85. Yeah. Just like m kind of milking it. <laughs> no, I was like, I was, I was actually talking a lot. I added songs to the set and I was like just enjoying being up there, you know? Yeah. We were just having, I felt like this not really um, cool communal, I don't know, energy or something um, happening. Uh, so I'm really just looking forward to, to more of that and wherever that takes me, I don't know. Like I said, maybe, I, maybe it's developing the show that way. Maybe I find something cool on my laptop tomorrow and I work on that, yeah. who knows. So main stage, Reading leads, lots of Freddie Mercury moves to kind of fill that space. Um, no, I'm just gonna, I'm, it's, it's just gonna be comedy. Yeah. I'll, I'm gonna do a song in the beginning and I'll do the song at the end. In the middle will Skits. just be, yeah, <laughs> kind of, um, I'm think I'm trying to decide whether it's uh, my two reference points are just um, Kathy Griffin and Dane Cook. That's yeah. just pretty much it. What was the last good joke you heard? Um, really, they I haven't heard any good ones, <laughs> so I think that says a lot about my standards. <laughs> Mike, thank you so much for your time. You're gonna get so much free Nando's. <laughs> <laughs> I think you are. Call me. <laughs>